Welcome back again. Uh, you may have recently caught my video on the Dayton RS125-8. Here we are to talk about the Dayton RS, R, the Dayton RST28F. Uh, that's the fabric version. So anyways, uh, today we're going to talk about this tweeter. We're going to test it, see what it can do, um, play with it a little bit in XSIM, and uh, in future videos, we are, 123 Toyd and myself are going to be working on this little speaker idea for our surround speakers in our home theater. So for today, we're going to look at this tweeter and let's get on to the testing right now. Okay, you may recall from my previous video about the RS125 that I commented about how packaging is generally pretty bad. And this is a similar level of packaging. You got a piece of styrofoam in a cardboard box. But there is this little neat thing. They got a cover to protect the dome and there's a little slip of styrofoam in there to protect the frame. And that was a nice touch. I thought it might be uh, a shim so you can kind of a gasket to put on the back so you can shim it up if you accidentally cut too deep or something in your baffle. But it doesn't seem to fit. Overall, it's a very attractive looking driver just like all the RS drivers from the Dayton RS series. Really sharp looking, nice solid flange, um, beefy terminals, more on that later though. Nice solid construction all around, very very good looking driver. You can see the dome actually has a mesh protective screen over it, so if you're not one for making grills, this might be a nice little feature for you. Overall, a very good looking driver. Okay, all I did was tin this terminal and try to get the two to, I just, I just wanna get a slight touch of solder on there. I don't want these things like, you know, really heavily soldered on there, just, to, just enough for testing purposes and stuff, right? And this thing loosened up, this, the heat, even though this is a pretty chunky terminal, something, the heat loosened something in here and uh, this was wiggly. And then I gave it a minute of cool down time and now it's firm again. So that's a little concerning that there's solder so close uh, to, the, to the voice coil leads that, well, got to be very careful when soldering, I guess. I hope there isn't any issues in there. Okay, let's try again. Sorry for the bad angle on this. I just wanted to show you unedited the time spent on the terminal and then the fact that it's loose. So the solder's cooled down enough to hold. Look at that. It loosens so quickly. That little bit of heat, that's all it took. Yeah, this one got loose too. With all the terminals now secure, because they've cooled down, I go ahead and mount them into the box. And the first thing I did was take impedance sweeps on the tweeters so that I could get the impedance. And here we can see this is nominally a 4 ohm driver. Uh, it's got impedance minimums around close to 3 ohms. The graph is zoomed in quite a ways. It looks worse than it is. You can see on the on the y-axis we have 0 to 10 ohms. So it's it, it's a, it looks a little worse than it is. In reality, FS, there's a difference between the drivers about 1.4 ohms. And overall, the difference throughout the bandwidth is about 0.2 ohms. So overall, a little more consistency would be nice, but it's actually not all that bad. And we see this kind of inconsistency quite often. Okay, next up, I went outside to measure the frequency response. And if this footage looks familiar, because you just watched the RS125 driver video, it's because it is the same footage. That's sample one. We can see here that we have, and here's sample two, um, I forgot to get an overlay measurement, so I did that in XM here. And overall, we can see that the driver is about 92 dB sensitivity, uh, which I believe is close to what Dayton specs, and is not bad for a form driver. Um, it, actually, it's quite good, but it's becoming more and more common nowadays to get about 92 dB out of a 4 ohm uh, 1 inch plus tweeter. What we do have that's problematic is there is a little bit of sensitivity difference between the two drivers, although not bad, about half a dB. Um, and there's also a lot of diffraction by the looks of things. We'll find out in a minute um, if it is diffraction related, but there's a big hole in the response uh, between three and 5,000 hertz or thereabouts. Um, unfortunately, this 
baffle that I'm using isn't really the best baffle to test this driver on because this tweeter is probably going to be matched to bigger woofers than I'm using um, and would probably be better tested on say an 8 inch wide baffle. Um, in any case, moving forward this is what we have to live with. Oh, there's also a little bit of odd inconsistency going on in the top end, kind of a, a peak uh, that I didn't expect to see from this driver, especially a fabric dome. I am happy to see that the response is extended way down to a thousand hertz, no problem. Uh, so provided there's no other, other issues, this thing should be able to cross very low and be well behaved all the way down to that low crossover. Next up, I took off axis measurements. Um, I mentioned in the other video that normally I turn the top speaker stand, but in this case I did it this way and prefer not to, next time I won't. But anyways, I take me measurements at 0, 15, 30, 45, and 60 degrees, and then I get this result. So what we can see from this result is that there is diffraction happening around 3500, 4, 4000 hertz, and quickly as we move off axis, the off axis measurements fill in that hole. So it's gonna be, we're gonna wanna be careful to not EQ uh, that hole and fill it in on axis because as you move off axis it'll become a peak and may sound fatiguing and, and gross. So when we're doing our crossover design we probably want to leave that hole the way it is and um, allow the natural sound of the speaker, the power response to, to fill it in. Um, outside of these diffraction problems we have what appears to be relatively clean off-axis measurements that we can work with. I then move the uh, speaker, I, I left the level at 92 dB because that's roughly where I do my distortion measurements and then move the microphone to 10 centimeters away to get the cumulative spectral decay and the harmonic distortion. So here in cumulative spectral decay, we have really good results actually. I think so. I think we um, there's only one or two slices, uh, you know, within 0.5 milliseconds that hang around, and then it and then things die very quickly. There's a little bit of ringing up in the top octave uh, that's associated with that peak, which makes me wonder if this thing isn't getting a little unhappy up there. Thankfully, that's way up there in frequency and be very hard to hear. Um, as we go way down in frequency, close to a thousand hertz, the ridges start to gather and bunch all the way out to about one and a half milliseconds. This thing probably isn't going to sound all that great down at one kilohertz, um, but for a 28 millimeter dome, I don't think you want to use it that low anyways. And then the harmonic distortion, third, fourth, and fifth order harmonics are way down, all the way down to a thousand hertz. Uh, second order isn't necessarily all that low, but completely tolerable, tolerable in my opinion. So that, that difference is a little bit uh, unusual, and I didn't expect to see this. I thought I was going to see more distortion below 2000 hertz. So at 2500 hertz, we can see that the nearest distortion is, of course, the second harmonic, and it's 34 dB down, so not really much to complain about there. Going all the way down to 1500 hertz, we can see the same thing. And look how low the fifth order harmonic is. And then down to 1000 hertz. This is where we really don't want to use this thing anyways, but it's still pretty clean. 27 dB for the second order harmonic. Really no issue as far as I'm concerned. So then I, as always, I throw it into XM and see what this driver can do and uh, I just start off with a second order uh, crossover, electrical that is, to see how this thing behaves, and uh, an L pad because it is a tweeter, so more, than, more often than not you are going to use an L pad. It's not the easiest tweeter to work with. Uh, the, the shape of the response with that diffraction is a little bit challenging, and, um, and the top end is also you know, looking a little bit funny the way it stands out like that. And I don't think it's worth putting extra parts on that 15, 16,000 hertz peak. So uh, overall, it's hard to know what to do with this, but it's not bad. And and this tweeter is going to have no troubles integrating with the RS-125. So I'm quite happy about that. And overall, I think this tweeter has a lot of potential. You can see that 
it can cross pretty low and with four parts I got something that can work. All right guys there you have it that is the Dayton RST 28F. I think that's the first time I got the model number right. Uh, pretty decent performer. Uh, some issues with diffraction in this box but I'm okay with that we can work with that. I would have liked to have gotten new test results on a wider baffle. Time just is working against me right now because I really want to focus on this project. But if I do get around to testing it on a wider baffle, I will include those test results on my Dropbox, on my Dropbox account uh, for you guys to download and try. So uh, speaking of which, you can do that with these files. Uh, I'll include the link in the description. You can go there, download them, play with them, try them out against other drivers to see if they're a driver you would like to use in your project. Uh, remember to subscribe and follow along. Check out 123 Toyd's channel as well to see what uh, he's cooking up with these speakers. He should have some videos coming down the pipeline soon. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to future videos. Thanks for watching. Catch you later. Goodbye.